Thanks for joining us today. I've learned a lot of different lessons during my 30 years with F-Secure. Lessons about how users always make mistakes, lessons about how patching is hard. But I think one of the most core lessons there is to learn is that complexity is the enemy of security. We've always had bugs in the code of the systems that we run. Programs are being written by human beings and human beings make mistakes. However, today when everything is interconnected, those bugs become vulnerabilities. They become vulnerabilities which can be exploited by attackers. And the more code we have, the more room we have for errors, more room for bugs, more vulnerabilities, more things to exploit. So the more we have code, the more we have protocols, the more we have features in the systems we use, the more vulnerable we are. And this is not a theoretical problem. Did you know that Windows 10, the current version of Windows, is a thousand times larger than Windows 95? In fact, Windows 10 is built from 5.7 million source files source files, I don't mean 5.7 million lines of code, 5.7 million source code files. I actually confirmed this with Microsoft. We're speaking about massively large systems. And if we really would like to fight complexity with every new release of every operating system, every application, every mobile app, we would be reducing features. But that's not what we're doing at all. We're increasing features, increasing complexity, increasing layers, increasing the attack surface. And the enemy, the attackers, they know this very well. That's why they are targeting systems which are becoming more and more complex. And managing security for these systems is getting harder as well. And this is why we at F-Secure have been so hard at work in bringing simplicity and bringing management easier to the fingertips of our users. Sometimes attackers can't reach the targets they want to reach. And for the last couple of months, we've all seen headlines about supply chain attacks. Attacks like SolarWinds or CodeCov, or maybe even the attacks against Microsoft Exchange server systems. You see, in many of these cases, the background of the attack is that the attacker tried to gain access to a specific target and failed because the target had done their homework. They, they were not easily breachable. So the attacker went looking for a technology being used by the target so that if they would be able to breach some technology used by the target, eventually the target could be breached through them. This is why SolarWinds was being targeted by most likely Chinese nation-state-based attackers. They needed to find a way into a target organization, and since the target was for them unbridgeable, they went after SolarWinds instead, assuming that sooner or later the client would update their SolarWinds software and become bridgeable by themselves. Kodakov is something similar as far as we know, and for the last couple of weeks, the amount of attacks we've seen through Microsoft Exchange-based systems have just been going through the roof. And if you're trying to defend your networks against a nation-state attacker, well, that's really hard. The good news is most organizations are not being targeted by nation-states. They're being targeted by criminals. And when we look at the methods organized online crime gangs nowadays use to make a lot of money, it revolves around two phenomena: Ransomware, especially ransomware version 2, and business email compromise attacks. And the biggest shift in ransomware over the last seven years has happened over the last 12 months. This is the shift where attackers have realized that more and more of the victims have full backups of the data. So even if you breach a network, you reach all the servers, all the workstations, and you encrypt everything and then demand a payment to get the decryption key, some companies don't have to pay because they have full daily backups of everything and they've rehearsed their restoration process. This is what has led ransomware gangs to migrating to ransomware version 2. It's the same idea. They breach a network, they encrypt the servers, 
But if the company doesn't pay, then the gang informs them that we've also copied all of your files. And if you don't pay us, we will publish your information on leak sites. Leak sites like these. This is the Mount Locker and the Klopp ransomware gang's leak sites, where they publish information about their victims. And if the victims don't pay, then they will publish their information. And this is the reason why we've seen so many ransomware gangs migrate from earlier mechanisms to version 2. This was started in January 2020 by the Maze ransomware gang from Russia, and this was so successful that the gang actually retired in October 2020. And we've seen a multitude of gangs follow their example, and this is also the reason why we've seen so many organizations and companies pay multi-million dollar ransoms. We always tell companies, don't pay the ransom. The more companies pay the ransom, the bigger the problem becomes. And that's really easy for me to say, and sometimes it's really hard for companies to do. One of the reasons companies end up paying ransom is that they realize that it's not just their corporate agreements and dealings and patent applications which would be made public, it's also their email exchange, including things like their employees emailing corporate healthcare about private health issues. No company wants that kind of information to be posted publicly on the internet. And this is the reason why we've seen so many publicly listed billion dollar sized companies beta ransoms over the last 12 months, including companies like Garmin or Campari or Brown Foreman, which is very close to all the heart of us Finns because they own the Finlandia vodka brand nowadays. And I think even better example on how much money is being moved around by these ransomware attackers is, is what happened with Tesla. An IT administrator at the Tesla Gigafactory in Texas was approached by a foreign hacker offering him $1 million for a very simple task. Accept a USB thumb drive, bring it into the Texas Gigafactory and plug it into one internal machine. That's it. You do that and you get paid a million dollars. The IT employee at Tesla didn't do it. No, instead he went to report it to his superiors who worked together with the FBI to arrest the Russian hacker who was offering the million dollars. I'd like to think that the IT employee at Tesla got a million dollar bonus for doing the right thing, but we actually don't know if he did. And when we speak about victims of ransomware operations, well, you might know this game. Cyberpunk 2077, one of the hit games of the year. What you might not know is that CD Projekt Red is the company behind this game. It's a Polish company, and they were hit with a massively large ransomware operation right as they were in the middle of releasing this game. This is the kind of attacks we see, where attackers look for companies which are especially vulnerable for disruptions of their services. The amount of money these gangs make with their online crimes is massive. We don't know exactly how massive, but we have some kind of an idea by following the amounts of ransom demands they send, or the Bitcoin movements in blockchain, or for things like these. This is a clip from a Ukrainian law enforcement video where they raid the headquarters of the Imotet gang, which has been involved in multiple different ransomware operations. You can see the law enforcement counting the dollar bills they are confiscating and counting the gold bars they are confiscating. And they always say that crime doesn't pay. Obviously, it pays very well. Another good example on how crime pays is when we look at the money being made with business email compromise attacks. Business email compromise or CEO scams make more money than ransomware operations. The amount of money is nicely illustrated in the Instagram feed of Mr. Raymond Abbas, this guy right here. From his Instagram, we can see that he lives a nice life with Rolls Royces in Monaco, in Dubai, and in his home country of Nigeria. He's originally from Lagos. He has been involved in multiple different uh, money laundering operations linked to business email compromise scams. And once again, 
crime seems to be paying very well. But the happy ending here can be seen from this video clip released by the law enforcement of United Arab Emirates, where they are raiding a five-star luxury hotel in Dubai, arresting Raymond, who since has been extradited to New Jersey, where he is right now waiting his trial. But it's not just about technology. It's also about the users. As we've learned during the pandemic year, users are easy to fool. When you somehow confuse users or scare them, they are not really paying attention to what's happening. They will think that something weird is going on and then they can be fooled. Say basic psychological tricks. And when user is fooled, he's not thinking straight. And the attackers know this. They know this. That's why they are able to fool users to pay attention to the wrong thing. Users click on the wrong link, end up getting owned. Basic psychological tricks. And when we are successful in defending our end users and implementing all the safeguards we want to implement, the end result is that nothing happens. The end result is that there are no data leaks, there are no data breaches, there are no malware out outbreaks. The end result is that nobody even notices we did anything. That's the way it works. So if we want to be able to secure the systems we use ourselves and our clients and customers use, we have to be able to reduce complexity. We have to be able to manage complex environments in as simple way as possible. And this is the thing we've been paying so much attention over the last years at F-Secure. Simplifying security, reducing complexity, simplifying the way we can provide security for you and for your end users. Thank you.